Speaking of that topic, our next guest has some practical ideas on how to ease the pain of the Great Recession and perhaps prevent the next one. So we're very pleased to welcome Nobel Prize winning economist, Columbia University professor and author Joseph Stieglitz. He is right here next to me. He has just released the paperback version of Free Fall, America, Free Markets and the Sinking of the World Economy. And he has added a new afterword. He revisits some of the predictions that he made about the course of the downturn. And he is offering us new recommendations for a road to recovery. So it sounds hopeful, Joe. We're so glad to have you anyway. <laughs> However, you say the one thing that has changed in the past eight or nine months when you first published the hardback version is to what extent it looks like a strong recovery is less and less likely. Why is that? Well, the global turmoil is the big uh, uh, one of the big changes. The other big change is there was that moment uh, a year ago when we were all king zings, everybody in the world was on the same uh, uh, notion that we needed to stimulate the economy, now they've taken a 180 degree uh, return, big austerity in the UK, now it's supposed to be announced today, uh, a lot of people in the United States saying we ought to pull back too. If that happens, the likelihood that we are going to have a marked slowdown, already in the process of a slowdown, but a marked slowdown, even possibly a double dip becomes much greater. If you had to put it on a scale of one to 10, how likely is it that we see a double dip before the end of next year? Well, what I would emphasize is the likelihood that we will be growing fast enough to create the new jobs for the new entrants in the labor force is close to zero. So that the jobs deficit is going to be growing, the problem that most Americans are worried about, unemployment, is likely to be growing. Uh, and uh, the result of that is all over the world there is going to be this kind of uh, competitive devaluation, bigger than neighbor policy, each country trying to take advantage uh, of the exchange rate because you can't use protectionism with in the old version with the WTO, so they're looking for the new form of, w, of, of, of bigger than neighbor policies, get your currency down. Okay, well that is the very latest on the, the exchange war, the currency wars, and you say the G20 is not likely to solve anything either, as we know there has to be a lot of political posturing there. What about the argument, and I think I know what you're going to say, but the fact that monetary policy is relatively flexible here and can adjust to even something as a currency war. Uh, that's absurd. In fact, it's monetary policy that is actually one of the main instruments, one of the factors causing the currency war. It, it's very simple. The U.S. is flooding the world with liquidity. In the old theory, that money would go into the U.S. economy and lift it up, but it, to a very limited extent uh, that's uh, occurring because uh, lending is not increasing. Uh, money in a global economy looks around the world for the best opportunities, and they're seeing that in the emerging markets. The emerging markets say we don't so need that. So we're believing too much in monetary policy. I know you wrote a piece to that effect in op-ed in the, in the FT earlier this week, and you say we need to be paying attention, more attention, to fiscal policy. That's the only thing that's going to get us out of the mess. Uh, more spending. The United States especially is the one country in the world that can afford it. We can borrow at you know, short term zero, long term two and a half percent. We have a backlog of high return investment projects, infrastructure, technology, education that yield far higher returns. And if we do those investments, our long term national debt actually goes down. So more stimulus is needed. But Joe, everybody asks this. What about this fear of kicking the can that all of us are making our kids pay for our mistakes now? The point is that if we take that money and we invest it, our balance sheet is stronger, not weaker. Really putting our children in jeopardy is what we're doing right now, not having the stimulus. I, my view is we can't afford not to have a stimulus. What will happen is the competitive position of the U.S. will get weaker. Uh, we, a phenomenon called hysteresis where the uh, skills of our labor get deteriorated as they remain unemployed. The unemployment rate among the 20 year olds is twice that of the national average. So we're losing our most important 
uh, asset, which is our human capital. We are back right now with the Nobel Prize winning economist and author and professor, Joe Stieglitz. We don't have enough time to go through your CV, but we are glad that you're here. Let's talk a little bit about what we alluded to earlier. We were saying that stimulus is necessary. The Obama administration, many business people say, is actually doing a good thing by trying to encourage investment. Uh, why is that not working? It seems to be a question of confidence. That's right. But the confidence is there just isn't demand there for the good. So this notion that if we could only get the deficit down, confidence would be restored is nonsense. Uh, but what do you think of what the Obama administration has said to business? Like, look, if you invest, there's going to be tax write-offs. We're trying to make this easy for you to grow your business. They're trying to help, but the fact is, if their demand isn't there, they're not going to 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 invest. Uh, they're not in the. And you're saying basically, if people don't have jobs, it doesn't matter. They can't buy anything, even if this business builds out. They're too afraid. They build it out, then nobody wants their products anyway, and the cycle just kind of repeats itself. That's right, and that's why the stimulus is what's needed. That gets demand up. That will get more confidence going, but the. The reality that we have to understand is that before the crisis, the American savings rate was zero. That was not sustainable. The savings rate is already up to 6%. It's likely to stay around there. I, I think it's healthy for the long run. But in the short run, there's that gap. And that unless, government's going to have to fill that gap for an extended period of time. It's not just that our banking system is sick. It still is not really healthy. It's not lending. But until we, we deleverage and, and, and address the overhang of housing, it's going to take a long time, we're going to need government to be there to, to fill that hole. How much do you think government would have to contribute for this ship to be righted, in your view? Uh, probably more than we're going to get. Go ahead, give me a number. So, Just throw it out. Well, I think that the way I would put it is we need more automatic stabilizers. What that means is the following. The government comes into the stakes and says, we'll fill the shortfall in your revenue so you can, kill, can, can keep your employees, keep schools running, keep hospitals running. If the economy recovers, the amount that you need to need will go down. But how much would the initial price tag be? Uh, the, probably the initial price tag is in excess of $400 billion a year. Okay. Uh, we have to remember that the stakes are contracting because their revenues are going down. They have a balanced budget framework. And if we don't put more money at the federal level, then the public sector is actually negative. And we saw that in the September data where 67,000 private jobs, not enough to for the new interest in the labor force, net ni minus 95,000, all public sector contraction. Uh, so you would say 400 billion is the shot in the arm, and then as time goes on, you're still giving support, but at a decreasing level. Hopefully it'll be decreasing because the economy recovers. You have these automatic stabilizers. We need less money for unemployment insurance, less money to make up for the shortfall of the stakes. Uh, but so how the, much would we save then, Joe, in the long term? In, in the long term, we'll actually be making a profit on some of this because if we grow the economy for every dollar I increase in the economy the tax revenues go up about 20 cents so in a uh, in the long term if we get just you know five six percent return on our investments the national debt is lower so this is just makes sense I mean just think about it right now the government can borrow at zero to two percent two and a half percent and there are so many re investments yielding returns of 10, 15, 20 percent. If you don't make these investments, you're really robbing your children. Joe, we have to talk quickly. That's a lot about stimulus, about this mortgage issue. We had huge headlines yesterday. The market sold off. What do you make of this latest move that basically puts Bank of America in the hot seat? We really made a lot of bad mortgages back in uh, the years before uh, the bubble broke. Uh, and we've been trying to postpone coming to terms with them. And we all know that there was an attempt to push a lot of these bad loans onto the government, onto the Fed, uh, onto others through securitization. And there were some provisions in the contracts that say, if you do that, we can put them back to you. And that's what's happening. And unfortunately, that's going to impede the recovery. Uh, of the banking system. Joe, thank you very much. Nobel Prize winning economist and author and professor Joe Stiglitz.